Well, hello. Hope you had a nice break. Um, I'm here ready to kick off uh, this uh, next panel on leading on purpose. And thank you to Libro Credit Union for presenting this session on the role of boards, investors, and accountants in advancing purpose, governance, and finance. To accelerate the uptake of social purpose in business, financial players and boards, they have a very important role to play. Because social purpose is a new way of doing business, there are many questions ahead, like what's the role of the board to provide oversight of the purpose and make sure it's future fit? What's the role of investors to help social purpose companies start, transition, and grow? And then what's the role of accountants in measuring purpose and authenticating purpose claims and disclosures? So we have a great panel here today to help us unpack these questions and more. In the conversations bubble there on the side, you will see a link to the Purpose Governance Framework for Boards, which I worked on in collaboration with Governance Professionals of Canada and the Social Purpose Institute. This framework provides a checklist for boards and governance teams to follow when they want to refresh their corporate governance systems to take into account uh, this new purpose narrative. Uh, on the matter of questions for the panel, we will have about 10 minutes or so uh, for questions near the end of the session. And to pose your question, look for a chat bubble with a question mark in it. This is the Q&A. Please type your questions in there and don't be shy. Um, it's great to have a number of questions from you uh, to see what's on your mind and what you would like to ask of our panelists. I'm going to introduce the panelists now and ask them to please turn on their video when I call them up to our virtual stage. Uh, so we have Upkar Arora. He's the CEO of Rally Assets, one of Canada's most respected impact investment managers. They are basically global thought leaders in impact investing. Uh, welcome, Upkar. Uh, next, we have Gord Beal. Gord is the VP of Research, Guidance and Support at Chartered Professional Accountants Canada. CPA Canada helps accountants navigate changing expectations of society acting in the public interest. And as the head of research and guidance, Gord leads much of this effort. Roger Beauchemin, he's the CEO of Addenda Capital and one of Canada's largest multi-asset investment firms. Gore, um, Roger is also the chair of the Responsible Investment Association, which promotes responsible investment in Canada's retail and institutional markets with assets over, my counting, two and a half trillion dollars uh, in Canada, but he'll write me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, thank you and welcome, Roger. And then last, but certainly not, not least, Rahul Bardwash. He's the president and CEO of the Institute of Corporate Directors, which helps directors keep abreast of governance developments in Canada and around the world. Rahul is also the chair of the Global Network of Director Institutes. And I am just going to let him know that I'm not sure if he's turned on his uh, camera yet, but he hasn't yet popped on the stage and there he is. And uh, just want to say that uh, it's very significant that a Canadian is chairing the global network of director institutes. And I'm sure that by the end of this panel session, you'll understand why. So um, all of these panelists, in fact, are at the forefront of purpose discussions. And they're here to share their thoughts on the role of boards, investors and accountants in mainstreaming social purpose in business. So we're going to get going now and we're going to start with you, Upkar. If you could introduce Rally Assets and then imagine out to 2030, what might be the role of investors to mainstream social purpose in business, in which business has a societal reason to exist? Thank you, Coral. Can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here and to be invited on this stage with my esteemed panelists, which I'm hoping to learn a great deal from. So nice to see you, Roger, Gord, and, uh, and Raul. Very nice to see you again. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, me. I'm the CEO of Rally Assets, as Coro mentioned. And what Rally Assets is, is really an impact investment 
management and advisory firm. Impact investing is all we do and it's all we've ever done. And what that really means in terms of basic terms is we help investors generate positive social and environmental benefit alongside a financial return. And the way we do that is through advisory services, through dedicated funds we set up and what we call separately managed accounts or customized portfolios, depending on the specific needs of an investor. And we do those for corporations, for some of the ones that will be on this call today, institutional investors, foundations, family offices, and accredited investors. Now, we are a social purpose corporation ourselves. We are a certified B corporation, a signatory to the UNPRI, which I'm sure uh, Roger will touch on later on. But uh, So that's a little bit about what we do, but let me tell you about why we do it. We have this fundamental belief that impact investing and using business as a force for good can be su uh, supremely impactful in terms of transforming the world by transforming how and where we invest our capital. And to connect it to today's topic, I will tell you that Rally Assets itself has emerged from a firm called Purpose Capital that's been around for more than 10 years. It started off uh, well before the, the topic of purpose was in the mainstream conversation. We've changed our name a couple of years ago to Rally Assets out of necessity and design, embarked on a new strategy that we could use to invest capital. But what we haven't done is change the DNA and the essence of our firm. That commitment to purpose as a social, social purpose organization has really never wavered or never faltered. So that's a little bit about us, a little bit about the why. And then I might turn it over, if I can, to Cora's question about looking out at 2030 and really thinking about that date and what will be different on that date as it relates to the perspective we'll take, which is really from an investment standpoint. So 2030 is a critical date for a number of reasons. It is the date defined by the Sustainable Development Goals uh, designed to ensure prosperity for the planet and people on that planet. We really see investors by that date having played a really significant role in catalyzing and transforming significant aspects of the investing ecosystem. So first of all, we see investors driving the change to move social purpose from the fringe to the mainstream, from this abstract idea to a concrete reality. And from conversations that we might have had with our colleagues and our co-workers on a Thursday uh, evening after work to a conversation that's happening with boards and the C-suite. The second thing we see is investors taking on a much more activist role in advocating for and engaging with companies to push them towards having a social purpose that's both defined and acted upon. The third we see is that we expect continued development of the tools and the access and the ability for investors to discern fact from fiction, to discern greenwashing to what's real, that will help to drive expectations and accountability from corporations. We see investors making more informed decisions as a result. Those decisions are driven by a better understanding of the real factors that drive performance over the long term, what we might call non-financial factors or externalities. And we see, therefore, a significant shift in the investment ecosystem. We see a recalibration or adjustment in the marketplace from a valuation standpoint to reflect the new reality of those factors, including purpose, that are really driving long-term performance and the valuations that will result from companies that are, in fact, living that purpose-driven language and commitment to purpose. And this we see not just in the public markets, the areas that Roger has a lot of expertise and will talk about extensively, but also in the private markets where private equity holds a great deal of the assets that are out there. And finally, the thing that we see also is an integration between the traditional actors, the business, the for-profit investors, pension funds, institutions, and also some not-for-profits, governments and other organizations to create unique blended finance models that can be come together to in fact to create greater impact from societal or an environmental standpoint as we think about blended finance and creative solutions using the investment landscape to really facilitate that. And Coral, with that, I'll just maybe turn it over to the next speaker. Well, I couldn't write down fast enough what you were saying because it's a real call to action. And it's going to really set uh, the, the course of this discussion, I think, in terms of the role of investors. But uh, that investors would drive it from the fringe to the mainstream, and that investors in the future, by 2030, would be playing an activist role, an engagement role, to push companies to have a social purpose and then hold them to account for it. 
with tools, et cetera. So it's this great vision that you've uh, introduced the panel uh, to Upcar and, and thank you for sharing. Of course, I'm gonna turn to Roger next, point counterpoint, uh, to speak to it from the uh, large asset management perspective and maybe the perspective of the Responsible Investment Association. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Coro, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, great to be here with uh, my colleagues and uh, and uh, you know really uh, engage in a in a wholesome conversation around purpose. Um, so, Addenda Capital is a, as you said, as an asset manager, we're uh, we're actually owned by a purpose organization, majority owned by the the cooperators, so a cooperative. Um, and and so uh, you know it, that that sort of approach is near and dear to our heart. Um, what we do at uh, at uh, Addenda is looking after really institutional mandates, uh, roughly about 40 billion uh, Canadian, mostly for insurers and uh, and um, pensions, as well as third party uh, mutual funds and sub advisory mandates. Um, on our, we have an approach where we integrate uh, non-financial analysis into our decision-making process, basically incorporating ESG into our decision-making process. Um, and we also have a, a very strong in stewardship uh, program, which maybe I'll come back to, in talking with issuers and discussing um, a, a number of issues, uh, many of them uh, around uh, the you know the non-financial aspects. But obviously, what we're there to deliver first and foremost is a is a is a risk adjusted return for our investors. Um, the, 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 the third piece is that uh, we actually have a pretty substantial impact uh, um, investment book. Uh, like uh, just like Upcar uh, mentioned uh, with Rally, uh, in fact, we're, we're partners on, on some strategies. Um, you know, we, we really try to look at things from an impact perspective, which means that we deliver uh, a market like financial return for our investors, but we also deliver um, objectively measurable non-financial returns which are known ahead of time before making that uh, intentful investment so it's it's not one or the other it is both it is both financial return and good outcomes um it's, it's it aligns very strongly with purpose obviously um and you can think of it as uh, sort of orienting your capital along the sdgs um that's that's one way of of looking at it um the other the other thing that um we uh we do is uh you know we uh so i mean that's enough about us i mean maybe like turning it over to uh those those impact investments just to finish off that that has about about, about five and a half billion dollars of impact investments on our books and and much of those are for traditional mandates which means that in traditional uh financial instruments uh mandates that clients are giving us we have we can actually measure outcomes uh, that they're not necessarily asking for us to do. Uh, we we believe that gives us better returns for them and and creates obviously very uh, favorable externalities. Now, um, with regards to purpose, I think that one of the things that we can see by 2030 is that not only are employees driven by purpose more and more. Uh, obviously, uh, consumers are also uh, of services and and products are driven by purpose, but investors are driven by purpose. And you can align your portfolios with outcomes, with generating outcomes, non-financial returns, and it's not giving one or the other. Uh, in a way, what you can think of as finance, finance is, is really the vascular system for society. Uh, it's what, you know, it, it is it is the lifeblood of society. Of it, what gets financed gets built, gets designed, gets done. Uh, the projects get completed. Uh, and and if you align that finance, if you align that capital with good outcomes, you're basically irrigating better muscles for society, the muscles that uh, attain uh, good outcomes. Um, and by 2030, I think that this will become sort of a mainstream uh, mainstream approach. In a way, uh, from an economics perspective, there's none of this stuff that I learned in school. Uh, and I think none of my colleagues learned in school when we were going through it. But it's hitting the curricula now. And I think you can, you can imagine that as we get um, practitioners that are already up to speed on what can be done, we'll be pushing the envelope more and more. So it's actually very, very exciting times. Uh, and it's a question of, of, of not only delivering financial returns for our clients, but it's, but it's really uh, aligning capital with what is needed to solve some of the planet's big problems. Uh, and, and, uh, and purpose is, is a real way of, of uh, understanding the DNA of companies um, and aligning them either with measurable outcomes or aligning them with, with uh, your portfolio returns so that your portfolio does good as well as it gives you financial returns. 
so both of you, thank you. Both of you are a match for each other, uh, kind of riffing off the same kind of impact story. And you're almost suggesting in the future by 2030, can we hope that all capital will be impact capital? And that all capital, all impact capital will be in aid of, as you say, to align capital with good outcomes and that this becomes a mainstream approach. So this is a, a vision we can have for ourselves about the role of capital. And now uh, with that context, I'm going to turn it next over to you, Gord, and you're going to pivot over to the accountant side of things. Um, maybe say a bit about CPA Canada, though I expect most will know you. Um, but over the next 10 years, what role might accountants play? top social purpose in business become mainstream. Well, thanks, Goro, and thanks again as well. As what my colleagues have already said, I very much appreciate being invited to be part of this panel and, and being able to share this the virtual stage with uh, with my colleagues here. Um, uh, it's such an important topic of conversation, as you and I have spoken of many times. And you know, I do believe that accountants can play a big role in all of this. Um, just briefly, Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada, we, we we collaboratively work with our provincial, territorial, and Bermudian bodies to represent the Canadian accounting profession, uh, both here nationally, but also internationally. And we actually have uh, over 220,000 members, uh, which makes us one of the largest uh, accounting bodies uh, globally. And, um, and, our bo and our members, I would say, are a pervasive lot. Um, they 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 hold roles in a wide variety of organizations, not for profits. They hold roles in public sector, in the corporate sector, and 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 of course provide professional services as well. And I think that's critical because I do believe accountants can play a critical role in uh, advancing some of these discussions. In preparing for this, um, and and this is I think right at the line of what what uh, both uh, Roger and and Upkar have said. Uh, I was looking at some of the letters that Larry Fink has written over over the years to the seat to the various CEOs and we you know Larry Fink the CEO of BlackRock and this one quote stuck out for me every time sticks out for me every time a company cannot achieve long-term profits without embracing purpose and considering the needs of a broad range of stakeholders and I think that's critical and I think increasingly we're seeing that that is the case you know and, and the role of accountants is um well, I could probably talk on for a while about my personal opinions of this, and these are my opinions, but I do believe there's a lot of foundation to this. The work we're doing at CPA Canada around reimagining the future of what accounting means is certainly extending ourselves to uh, the whole what's going on in the world in terms of how organizations are defining purpose very differently, stakeholders are defining uh, purpose very differently, how we measure and ultimately define success for organizations um, is, is no longer by any means, just about profit. Um, and and I, I'm going to highlight three things from an accounting point of view. And and that's just, just, just to start with. Um, and, and the first one, um, yes, you won't be surprised to hear this from the accountant in the room, um, even though it's only a virtual room. Um, uh, don't ignore the financial stuff. Um, whether, whether you're a not-for-profit, a B Corp, or a full-fledged for-profit organization, financial sustainability is a key success factor. And we've heard it We've heard both Roger and Upcar refer to the, the whole role of, of capital. I mean, in defining social purpose, it needs to be connected to the business model and the strategic focus of the organization. It needs to permeate every aspect of the organization. And the purpose should help to define how the organization is ultimately driving their financial sustainability. Because this is really key to the organization's maintaining its ability to deliver on its purpose. Someone needs to stay on top of this. And that's going to be a role of the accountants uh, to tie that, that together. And as much as we also want to make a difference in the world, money and access to capital will continue to be a key driver of organizational success, purpose-driven or not. And so I, I, I wanted to highlight that first and foremost. Um, I, I think the next key for me is the, the development of effective metrics to help management and external stakeholders monitor progress uh, towards goals, help define and report success in the achievement of, of the defined purpose. And this is critical. I mean, that, that clarity about purpose up front tied to strategy and the business model will enable the development of appropriate performance metrics that define organizational success and will help management run their organizations and demonstrate to stakeholders that they're actually working towards the purpose that they are stating uh, publicly. Um, and these kind of metrics, the, the impact or outcome-based metrics, are often the toughest, toughest metrics to develop, um, but they are critical in terms of demonstrating the achievement of objectives. And this is, again, where I believe uh, through the, the training that we get as accountants, which is all about metrics, it goes beyond the financial side of things. Accountants can help, and in fact, I believe need to help in accounting about more than the numbers. 
And finally, of the three that I wanted to mention up front here, I guess uh, in response to your, your specific question about what should happen between now and 2030, Coral, um, two words very near and dear to my heart uh, as an accountant, accountability and transparency. Um, we need to help organizations and our clients uh, with these two words in connection with the purpose. The two, these two words are really critical. As an organization, um, it's important to publicly state or disclose what you're going to do. What are you trying to achieve with your purpose? Make sure you can do it and then do it and tell everybody that you've done it. I mean, those are the fundamentals of disclosure and accountability. And the accountant does that very successfully on the financial side and the accountant will do it successfully on the broader purpose side of things. Uh, the accountant in business needs to be right at the front and center of ensuring that a company has the capability to deliver, has the resources to deliver, capital to deliver on the stated purpose and appropriately communicate it or disclose it publicly so that investors and other stakeholders uh, get the information that they will need to make decisions about those organizations. And I guess just to finalize, I guess it's sort of a tie into that last piece is where assurance can come in. And maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that afterwards, but there's an important role to be played by the whole assurance side of our profession as assurance professionals, audit, audit auditors, shall we say, in terms of providing assurance on the alignment of purpose to the business model and to what the organization is actually capable of. So those were, um, those were a few of my comments, I guess, to start with, uh, Coral. I hope we can unpack a few of those a little bit more. Fantastic. So another great roadmap we can hear. Uh, and speaking of roadmap, this is to help build the Canada's purpose economy roadmap. So we got a lot of data points we can add here. You'll be happy with data points, which of course you're going to uh, do some assurance to make sure that they're authentic. <laughs> we'll look for that. But, uh, look for the auditor in the point, room, eh? <laughs> the auditor in the room. There's always an auditing joke. Um, but you, you're making the point that the social purpose needs to be connected to the business model and to how it will drive financial sustainability. That's central. And I saw a lot of head nods here when you said that. The need for effective metrics and then the role of accountants in, um, in qualifying them and defining them and making sure that they exist. And then their role on, in disclosures and assurance basically on those purpose metrics. So um, that's a great vision uh, for the role of accountants going forward. And so now over to you, uh, Rahul, uh, if you can uh, briefly introduce ICV and then um, share with us your thoughts on the role of the board and the director's role in the future. Super, well, great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Um, my comments hopefully will complement uh, what my colleagues have already said a little bit earlier, some great comments there little snapshot on the Institute of Corporate Directors. Many of you know us as uh, ICD. It's a membership association, not for profit, over 16,000 members from coast to coast to coast. And our membership is made up of both for profit and non for profit and quite a balance of both. You'll be interested to know that we have a purpose, too. And our purpose is to build trust and confidence in Canadian organizations by developing and activating directors. So we build trust and our ping in the universe as it is, is in the boardroom. And we're driven by this belief that better directors making better decisions will collectively build a better Canada. So it's a leadership community that, as many of you know, um, is absolutely instrumental in oversight of culture, strategy, and risk. Now, the question you put in front of me was around, what's this all look like in 2030? And I have to chuckle because once upon a time, 2030 seems so far away but it's right around the corner. But the good news is there's a lot of momentum to the changes we need to see in 2030. And I'd start off by saying to, to appreciate where we're going to be in 2030 is to appreciate where we are right now. And one important respect as it relates to boards. And that is what I would call orthodox corporate governance is being challenged. It's fundamentally being challenged. And a, a very pithy way of looking at this is that old statement of the business of business is business that old Milton Friedman saying is really being looked at very differently now. So the business of business of business led to the notion that the duty to the corporation, which is the fiduciary duty of a director and what their focal point was, was in fact a synonymous with a duty to shareholders. And that's what's been changing, particularly over the last decade. So now we know that a duty to the corporation is, in fact, a duty to a host of stakeholders, including broader society, but there's open to discussion there. But the real catch on all of this is that whereas in places such as the U.S., we'll see that there's a lot of debate on what this duty is, what I've just described as the duty to the corporation being to all stakeholders is enshrined within our CBCA. 
So this is a national piece of corporate legislation. We've been doing a lot of this in Canada. Now, the devil's in the detail on how boards balance these. Uh, it's quite the balancing act, but we can talk about that a little bit later. But one of the corollaries to this, and I think it's, per it's worth talking about because we're speaking about purpose, is that corporations always did have a purpose. It might be not the purpose we're talking about now. It might have been too much of a narrow purpose. But the purpose was there, whether it was shareholders or otherwise. But now we're at a time when there's been a sea change, that shaking up of the orthodoxy that I spoke about, that's really driving it to a much, much broader purpose. And this is well beyond what B Corps have been doing. It's becoming something that more broadly being accepted within the corporate sector. So when I look ahead to 2030, the question is, is where does this trajectory take us? And it's still going to be the board's duty to have oversight of culture, strategy and risk, but it's going to be a completely different context. And I think that the directors and boards of the future need to be more agile and they will be more agile. They'll be more comfortable. They'll have built that muscle in dealing in a multi-sector environment. And to do that, they're going to be more diverse. And there's a lot of conversation going on about diversity on boards, not only to decrease risk, but also to get those diverse points of view around the table so that multi-stakeholder lens can be more efficient, more effective, and as Gord noted, is more connected to the strategy and purpose of the organization. Maybe I'll pause there and we can start to unpack that in the conversation as well. Great. Um, just to, what I kind of, where you had me, you had me at, the orthodox corporate governance is being challenged. And I think that's why we're all spending a couple of days trying to understand what is at hand here and what is the potential of that. And you're saying this is definitely for B Corp type companies, but it's also for large publicly traded corporations who are equally looking at refining and upgrading their corporate purpose so it's fit for the future. And then the role of the boards to have oversight of that, I think is what you're bringing to the foreground here and the central consideration of stakeholders. Uh, so thank you all for kicking off our panel with those uh, really profound answers. And they've never been said in the world collectively quite like this way. And it's what we can do in Canada here. Uh, and I just have to give you a shout out, Gord. I don't know if you saw it from Sue Todd, uh, who is was one of Canada's first social purpose auditors. Uh, she says, very convincing on the role of accountants, Gord. So if Sue Todd says that, I'm pretty sure that you're on a good path. She's a CPA as well. Um, all right, so I'm now going to go to our next question and I'm gonna start with you, Gord, in fact. Uh, with this um, 2030 vision in mind of the role of accountants, we're gonna look for another thumbs up from Sue Todd on this. So, you know, it's been set up for you. Um, what targeted actions and steps are needed with this 2030 vision in mind that you shared, what actions and steps are needed so that accounting accelerates shifts towards more companies adopting and implementing a social purpose? Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a, a great question, Coral. I you know I find myself immediately reflecting on what uh, Raul said a, a moment ago about the orthodoxy of governance and 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 what it means to be a, a corporate director. Um, I would say that. Similarly, the orthodoxy of accounting is 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 changing right be before our eyes. I mean, the reality is is we are challenged by um, I mean AI and technology that's replacing some of the the fundamentals of of doing the traditional accounting type rules, um, and and so in that sense, um, I personally don't uh, envision the end of accounting. In fact, quite the opposite. I see accounts adding value in very different sorts of ways. Um, it's funny because when I first became an accountant, I sort of soon after went, why did I become an accountant again? I'm, I, the numbers are fine, but that's not really what motivates me or or, or gets me all passionate. And, and it's interesting because as I've worked with organizations over the years, I would I would agree with Rahul, Rahul that that many many organizations have purpose, corporations have purpose, but I think we're we're refining that, and and the world is changing around us in terms of uh, of of expectations of the different stakeholders, as 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 referred, was referenced by both Roger and up car earlier on is is that there there's a the way that organizations deliver value is changing and and so in that context um, how the role of accountants add value is changing and needs to change and respond to that um to that situation 
but it's not just accountants, of course, that are going to change that. So I, I think to myself that it's, there's going to have to be alignment ac across the entire ecosystem. So it's about the changing expectations. It's about the way we manage businesses. It's the way we, we deliver on and define success. It's from the expectations of investors and other stakeholders to the customers and the employees. Purpose is, I believe, a unifying idea for business, it's a mission that can cascade right throughout, throughout the employees, through the suppliers, as I say, up and down the supply chain, out to customers and stakeholders more broadly. It, it, can, it can extend what, in fact, an organization can accomplish. And by having it consistently draw together those various stakeholders, that can advance this, I think, in a very solid way because it raises the expectations. I can tell you, we're going to have some pushback from some of our members saying, wait a second, we're good at the numbers. Give us our debits and credits. That's what we want to focus on. And I think one of our challenges as a profession is to overcome our traditions, our orthodoxy, our ways of doing things. And I would say uh, a step further than that is also help others who rely on accountants perceive accountants differently. So that we're not just crunching numbers or counting beans. And if we are counting beans, we're counting a much broader range of beans than we've ever counted before, shall we say. And so we need everybody working in the same direction. I think the other piece of this is that is going to be really important is the, the this, this having the capability and capacity to deliver to deliver. So that's going to be true within the organizations themselves. Um, you know, I mentioned it earlier on. It's whether it's the the, the capital that you have to have or the, the the internal strength, you know, bench strength and human human resources that are going to deliver it. But it comes right on to the I'm going to I'm you know specifically talking about the professional accountant. You know, we we can help organizations achieve those capabilities. Uh, the CFO is there to, to, to raise capital to help the organization achieve its strategies. This is going to become part of that, but this is going to require training for our members. It's going to require um, training for new members, maybe even attracting new types of members into the profession who see the importance of this space and, and feel they can make a difference. And in fact, when I talk to young people and I talk to universities across the country, there's great enthusiasm for young people to join the profession where they can yeah, help organizations be successful, but help organizations be successful in a way that goes far beyond profitability and shareholder value, but one that actually defines success more broadly. But it's going to take some training and development. It's going to take some capacity building within our own profession. And we have to acknowledge that we only know so much. One of the things I've always been very proud of in the profession is uh, knowing what we know and knowing what we don't know and knowing when we need to bring the right subject matter experts to the table and who we have to work with. Collaboration, it goes right back to my initial point, right across the board is going to be key in achieving the purpose that we set out for ourselves. So some of the um, action steps maybe going forward um, is to be attracting new types of members into the accounting profession and to develop a training and capacity building program within the profession uh, to help uh, your members start to move into this new area. As you say, um, the way organizations deliver value is changing and how accountants add value is changing. And so you're speaking to accountants sort of evolving with society as well. Thank you for that uh, set up there, Gord. Carl, just, and, uh, just one thing, yeah. one minor thing, just to say that, that there are many accounts like Asu Todd and others out there that are leaders out there in the space too. So I think leveraging off of the knowledge and the expertise of other uh, professional accountants across the country who are actually demonstrating some leadership in this space. Um, I, I want to make sure that it's, uh, you know, I'm very proud of, of those kind of members who are actually out there ahead of us saying this is important. And, and we as a professional are learning and we want to help others learn. All right, Sorry. Great. Thanks. So, um, well, yeah, well, Sue's happy for that too. She's had a couple of shout outs now, here we go. Um, and so maybe I also wanna say at this point, please, I see one question in the question box. Please drop your questions in the question box for a little bit later. We're now going to turn to UPCAR. And again, with the vision that you set out uh, about the role of investment in finance in the future, what are some action steps, UPCAR, that can be taken to accelerate the shift that you this towards this vision that you described? Coral, thank you. And Gord, really great comments and really valuable insights. Um, Coral, I would start with really saying that we need, we need to take a systems view, a systems thinking view, and really think about each of the component parts and who the players and actors are with respect to that um, as we think about the kind of changes that are needed. So we've got that high level issue and thinking through the various players, what their roles are, because we want to change the fundamental system to achieve what you sort of earlier alluded to, which is 
all investing is impact investing and it's embedded into the the way we look at how we invest our capital but let me break that down into something a little bit more specific and narrow so i've sort of broken it down to maybe five or six key buckets the first bucket is expectations and it's enhancing and elevating expectations and those expectations go to a number of the stakeholders that play a part in that system's change. So if we think about the companies themselves, if we think about the regulators, there's more and more push for greater regulation, greater policy changes, encouraging disclosure, greater standardization of terminology. And as Gord mentioned earlier, a greater ability to report on the adherence to or compliance with or consistency of the disclosure that we get from various companies. So the CPA obviously has a role in that. The data providers, the MSCI's assistant analytics have a role to play. And then obviously a number of providers, the parties that provide us with the tools and access to evaluate that data to reach conclusions about investment, obviously have a significant role to play. So that's sort of, we, we should be demanding more and expecting more from all the players in the sector. The second I see is really elevating its importance. And Rahul summarized that best to say, if you think about what's on the boardroom table, yes, we can really categorize around culture, strategy, and risk, but the specific aspects of that are now related to ESG and DNI and cybersecurity and uh, climate change. Those are very different topics under those broad-based umbrella topics that Rahul mentioned. So we need to elevate the importance of that to the boardroom and also to the C-suite. The third, I think, is really the integrating the aspects that Roger touched on in terms of our approach to how we think about investment. Roger touched on ESG integration. We take it a bit further and look at impact, but the way we view it is to say, we need to look at that ESG focus and we need to look at inputs, outputs, and outcomes to say, what are the outcomes we're trying to achieve from an investment and what are the outcomes that companies trying to deliver, not merely using ESG as a risk mitigation or assessment tool, but actually trying to evaluate the impact of what it's doing. The next category I've sort of um, categorized as creating and enhancing coalitions. And so we've come out of COP26 and I think all four of us on this panel could come up with the next 30 minutes of acronyms for various coalitions that have formed to encourage change. But you know, here's the good news that if you go back you know, five or 10 years ago, we didn't have UN or 10 years ago, UNPRI and the climate change coalitions and so forth. We've got people coming together, recognizing that there's strength in numbers and therefore a way to make change is to bring people with a common intent, a common purpose, a common mission to really catalyze that change as a result of the pressure that can be applied through a combination of players and actors as opposed to individually. And, and so that's an important uh, element, but also the nature of those coalitions, which I think all three of my colleagues would agree, is that we need different voices at the table that provide a different perspective as to what we need to look at, not just people who have the same view, the same bias, the same perspective perspective in order to achieve the stakeholder concept that Rahul and Roger and Gord and you, Coral, have referred to earlier. And then the last element I think that's really important is actually redefining leadership. And so we've got, you know, and, and I think we all know this Paul Pullman's book, for example, there's a new book by David Cooper Ryder. We're, we're trying to redefine purpose-driven leadership and what that looks like in today's business world to say it's not about the traditional ways we look at it historically. It's not about financial return. It's not about short-term maximization of profit. It is stakeholder-driven. It is long-term oriented. And therefore, when boards and C-levels think about leadership, the way we hire, the way the skills we look for, the way we compensate and reward those CEOs and C-level uh, leaders needs to be different in this world of purpose-driven leadership. So we need major changes and that go to the last thing I'll just say to close out. And uh, it was referred to earlier. If you look at the major business schools in the US today, the Wharton, the Harvard, the Yale, the Princeton and so, and so forth, you will find that there's more courses today about social impact, purpose, responsible investing, green finance than there has been ever as a result of the realization that we need those skills in that new world. And there's a latent desire to work for organizations that embody some of those characteristics as well. So that leadership change starts early and goes all the way to sea levels at the present time. So I don't think I can do this justice, but 
you know, we've got a number of players to organize from on this, from regulators to data providers and others to get them equipped to understand this new narrative in business and what and what role they could play to elevate the importance of this to uh, boards and the C-suite and in so doing, redefining what we expect of leaders and uh, the education of our leaders, and then look uh, for uh, measurement around the outcomes of the investments and the impacts of the investments and build coalitions around it. So uh, that's a great list of ideas that we can add to the Canada Purpose Economy Roadmap and soon we'll be going into breakouts for all other folks listening in to for them to weigh in on what they think the steps should be. Um, and so uh, we'll go to you um, then, um, Roger, uh, a fast follow. Yeah, just I, I I think what I'll do is I'll end up linking uh, both Upcar and and Gord on on two things, which is uh, first of all a, a, a small announcement a couple of weeks ago uh, that has a momentous uh, I think import uh, not only uh, for sustainability and investing but also for Canada, which is. Uh, a big shout out to CPA for helping move the ISSB. So that's the International Sustainable Standards Board. Uh, and Canada is going to be a hub. Uh, so Frankfurt and Montreal are going to be the two main offices. Uh, this is huge because what it does is it, it starts lining up metrics with with uh, like like with, and and reporting and and having a robust review of that and letting like audits take place. And that's going to be critical. So a huge, huge uh, step. Uh, and Canada is really at the forefront, which is extremely exciting. Um, so I think that's a very important step because as Upcar said, data and metrics are a critical, critical uh, part of this um, to align better investment decisions, but also measurement of of, uh, of outcomes. And uh, so I think that's, and this is all the non, this is basically non-financial information. Uh, so what it is, is it creates an, an IFRS model. It's actually run by IFRS for, uh, for non-financial. So you'll, you'll be, it's like an, a standards board for non-financial uh, information, which is really what purpose falls right into. Um, and so that's a, that's a big piece. Uh, at RIA, um, you know, one of the big things that we really want to work with is education. And education at a, at a bunch of levels, really at the issuer level. So the importance, we come together. Uh, RIA, uh, you know, we put in, uh, we put out a couple of statements in the past year, uh, a Canadian investor statement on DEI, uh, and, uh, and then more recently, a Canadian investor statement on um, climate change. And that's like just 36 investors there, more than $5 trillion uh, worth of uh, assets and assets under management and assets owned. Um, so that starts talking as a voice. And we're, when we band together, we can advance things a, a lot more significantly. Um, the, the, uh, that's, so on issuers, that's a, that's a big piece. So getting them to understand the importance of disclosure. Uh, and getting at disclosure. Um, and I think the ISSB and TCFD frameworks were going to be very critical for that. Then then there's the manager piece. So asset managers and asset owners, uh, getting them to work on this, uh, getting them uh, in the, the tent and uh, getting, I mean, I need my competitors to start doing what we're doing. Uh, we, Rally and I selves, like we, we need, we want more people uh, because if more people align their capital that way, that creates more outcomes and that, and that really, and that can involve uh, pricing, uh, because then, you know, like, uh, you, you maybe put a financial price on things, but maybe you put a non-financial price on things. Uh, and that's very important. And I think that's momentous. Um, and then, and then there's the whole side of our investors, our clients, we need to educate them. Um, we need to get them uh, to understand what the potential, uh, of their investment decisions is, what could they align? What could they create? What could they help happen in the future? Um, so there's a huge education piece. And of course, then there's all there's a government piece and then there's a regulatory piece. And those are critical as well. Um, and, you know, we are advancing those. I must say the CSA is making bold steps here, but we need to do more. Uh, and because it needs it can't be just capital. Finance alone will not do it. We need regulators. We need government action. Um, and and to create safe harbors for our investors, to create uh, to create uh, also uh, uh, a responsibility for our investors to do a certain way, um, and I think that so it's multifaceted, 
but education is a huge piece and I've left out the the university piece which Upcard touched on and I, I touched on before and that's going to happen because a uh, it needs to it also needs to happen at the at the credential level for us uh, on the investor side it's the CFA Institute and I must say they've been very dynamic at this uh, for what was really a stodgy uh, art you know my investment we're investors we're always like behind the game and now this the weird thing is we're ahead of our clients in some cases and and that's a very un, un, uncomfortable place to be uh, but CFA is really the CFA Institute is really lining up uh, in fund you know on fund labeling structuring and understand so clients can also understand investors can understand like what kind of promises they're signing up for um, because you know one one person's responsible investing is not another person's so but there's a framework you can articulate that and the, the CFA Institute framework is going to help guide that uh, momentously and I think that you're gonna see the CSA line up with that as well so I think education is the name of the game but you know by 2030 we're gonna be doing things that are very very cool so and purpose is going to drive it we're going to be doing things that are very, very cool by 2030 and purpose is going to drive it. Uh, you spoke again to um, the reporting, disclosure, outcomes, metrics, very common theme here and education. So you added investment managers, education of clients, education will add that to of accountants and of uh, leaders, whether that's in undergraduate uh, degrees or continuing education, exec ed. So there's a, quite a big um, education agenda going forward i as yet don't see any questions in the uh question box which is like a good thing because uh, our, our panelists have a lot to say already uh, even without your questions but having said that we do encourage them so if you have a question please drop it into the question box where i can spot it there rahul over you to uh, reflect on this question and again you know when you were describing uh you know by 2030 what might it look like for boards to have oversight of purpose and what is their role there in changing the orthodox of government of governance what are some action steps like what's needed now to kind of accelerate towards that sure so maybe my comments i'll aim at trying to amplify and complement uh, what uh, the others have said there's been a lot of talk about how allocation of capital measurement things like that come together to create this momentum of change and i would sort of submit that a lot of those decisions are made at the board level and in the c-suite and that's where the conversation takes place so let me address that part of the targeted actions that boards can take and frankly they're quite simple but i want to take you back to my earlier comment around orthodoxy when people hear orthodoxy being challenged they think okay out with the old in with the new it doesn't have to be that complicated because the very mechanisms that made that orthodoxy successful in its own time that need to shift, the mechanisms exist within it, its own logic to change. And what do I mean by that? That means where you've got boards that are looking at their strategy, a good board would also be looking at its own board matrix to say, do we have the right people around the table to be able to have proper oversight and guidance of this strategy? Now, if you shift the purpose of the organization, you can also shift the strategy to support and drive that purpose. A good board in making that pivot will ask themselves the question, do we have the right people around the table to drive this strategy to achieve this purpose? So the, the, logic, the logic of it still exists, at least in my view. So it's quite simple on one level. Do you have a board that's committed to a purpose? Is it looking at its own matrix? And when it looks at its matrix, is it actually committed to creating the type of diversity it needs on that board to, to properly have oversight of this, uh, this strategy in terms of avoiding unconscious bias, you know, minimizing risk, getting different points of view on the table. So for instance, if you're moving your company into a, um, a new part of the world, do you have somebody who's actually done that before? either doing business in that culture or they're aware of the culture and actually having launched something there. I mean, it's on one level, it's rather simple. So some folks might feel, boy, we need a really big culture shift here. Absolutely, there needs to be a culture shift. But the mechanisms exist within the existing order right now of corporate governance to do that. And that's why you're seeing a fair amount of change happening fairly quickly. The second part I put on this is around board education. Roger picked up on that. So did Gordon. I know it's in, in, in UPCAR's uh, vocabulary as well. 
Board Education. It's why we exist at ICD. It's why we just launched our climate course with uh, WEF with and the CGI principles. I mean, all of this stuff, we do so much work with CPA. That's our risk framework was done in conjunction with CPA. So there's a lot of collaboration going on. But above all, you've got to have the education tools and the skills and knowledge transfer available to people who are committed to making the change that they're signing up for. So there's an enormous part of the cultural shift that's about personal commitment. And if you've got the personal commitment and the tools, I'm trying to say that the mechanisms exist within the existing corporate governance framework to actually make those pivots. Some are going to be better at it than others. Some are going to be faster at it than others. But it, you don't have to throw it all out and start all, all over again. And hopefully that's a foundation of optimism to build off of. That is a foundation of optimism to build on. You know, and you made the point that if you shift your purpose, you shift your strategy. And then the boards would need to be assessing, do you have the right people to drive this strategy to achieve this, pers this purpose? Do you have the right people on the board? And then they'll want to make sure, of course, that they have the right people in the executive team as well. So these are the kinds of conversations that an organization that refines or codifies or formalizes or upgrades its purpose to be future fit. These are the kinds of conversations we'll be expecting boards to have going forward. You know, I do have a few questions now. Seems, um, well, anyways, here they are. I am looking for questions that um, are a bit generic. And so um, here's one here. Are there any, um, I would say just, are there any particular program certificates or memberships that the, that you have seen uh, that resulted in folks with the right systems perspective and data to influence leaders and practical knowledge to execute the how towards the why? So I think we're looking for, are there programs or certificates or masters or memberships that help folks move in this direction? Like who's who's got some good programming here, do you think? Ah, there's your there's your gap right there. <laughs> who ought to have good programming? Who 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 ought to have good programming? Go ahead, Rahul. The the short answer is there's no shortage of good programming out there. CPA has got a ton of stuff. ICD, this is what we exist for, and this is why once again I think there's a source of optimism here that we've actually got a lot of assets and brain power focused on this. We've got two individuals who are talking about capital and how it needs to change. And Roger, kudos to you on, you know, shout out to your competition. Get on that horse and ride it too. I mean, the, the institutions are there. It's the same thing we do at ICD. You know, Apcar was talking about the business schools and we've got relationships with all of them. And, you know, there's a real sea change happening here. So I think the point is to, to not get you know, too fussed about it, but go in the direction that drives your own personal interests and find your area because I think there are a lot of willing parties out there to part with, partner with you to, to, to build off of these and amplify it. And I guess the other thing is if you would say to that is if the, the place where you normally get your education isn't providing it, you at, start to reach out to them and let them know of your interest and, and they need to hear from, uh, from people in business or investment or finance or in accounting or or any professional group, HR, any at all, they need to hear that their members are interested in this kind of education. And when they hear it, then they'll start to provide it. I think is partly what you're saying as well, Rahul, is it probably exists, but um, um, any so social purpose champion could ask for more from the places where they already associate. And, and Cora, if I could just add, I think I think Rahul's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, in conversations with post-secondary institutions across the country and our own our own organization rules organization and others um, there's more to come so you know we're we're, we're being ver we're very much paying attention to what's going on out in the marketplace uh, to respond to the needs and expectations of our members of other stakeholders and the universities are looking at new programs systems approach to things the, the way that you integrate purpose the way that you integrate sustainable development uh, so it's it's uh, there's more to come and I think the challenge probably in, in many ways will get to the point where you have to pick and choose and 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 put your own you know put your own menu together of, of of training opportunities knowing what you want and knowing where you want to get to and if you do find there's a gap i think coral you're right on reach out to 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 whether it's your member organization or to uh the universities and say we need more of this because i think there's a real desire to be responsive to these these emerging opportunities that's great rahul did you want to add to that were you Okay. 
you're on mute. I don't know if you're wanting to still unmute. Top left corner. There we go. It's back on. There we go. We're in a competitive environment for education. These are precisely the conversations that all the education institutions are having. If you want to stay relevant, you've got to be a part of the conversation we're having today. Well, I kind of want to end the panel right there, but we're going to hang out for another six minutes. I, I was going to float another question, but Roger, did you want to speak to this? Yeah, just uh, also, I, I think that it's not just education. I think we've got, I mean, as much as I pressed for it, but I mean, organizations where they're at now, they have authentic leaders and within, within them. And you've got to give them the ability to grow and to take and to take that that organization to another place. Uh, you don't need to just teach it. Some people have it in them and they've they've learned it on the job and they've seen it done. And so that shouldn't prevent us, you know, from stepping forward in, in the gap. Uh, if you look at uh, the leaders that have come through already, they didn't come through any education program. Uh, uh, you know, these are women and men that uh, just saw what needed to be done and saw the purpose and how it could galvanize people and, and organizations and do the right thing. So, um, you know, like, I, I just want to make sure that we don't stop at just having that education credential. Like, we know it needs to be done and uh, give, give your management team the chance to do it. So I'm going to take another question here. I'm going to direct it at you, Upkar. It's about um, um, rather than speak in terms of 2030, what do we do to address the gap in investment into purpose funds, purpose companies, impact funds, impact companies? Like, what do we do to address the gap now rather than wait until 2030? Like, what what would really accelerate this altogether? So, uh, Carl, I think it's a maybe two or a three pronged strategy. One is to the extent that people have influence, I'd certainly be pushing for greater policy change. We've had a number of initiatives floated by various people like Bill Young and others talking about, for example, foundations needing to invest a certain portion of their assets for impact, freeing up $60 billion to accelerate the flow of impact capital to the space. We've seen a number of initiatives from the government, the Social Finance Fund, which is coming out and has now an RFP is, is out there, $682 million, which is going to be leveraged two to one by private capital, a $2.1 billion shot to try to promote and create a more vibrant ecosystem primarily focused on private equity impact opportunities. We have seen greater expectations and needs of some of the major investors as to disclosure. So if you think back, and Roger will correct me here, but if you think about the Trump decisions to actually make the regulations around disclosure of ESG-related disclosures weaker, who said, no, we want more disclosure? It was the investors. They want okay, the we're going to leave it right there. Okay. It was the investors because that's a great place to leave it. Um, and so what I'm going to have you all do, because we've got three minutes left in our session. So um, but uh, I have to say my own takeaway is um, just the momentum that is really already out there that you are all speaking to. Um, and what I'm going to have you do now is, you know, like a half a minute kind of answer each, answering the question for one final idea for how investors, accountants and boards can help mainstream social purpose and business speaking to your uh your perspective and so i'm gonna have you go first gord briefly half just half coming in there we are i unmuted myself okay i'll be very quick um just quoting the world business council for sustainable development back in 2012 the ceo at the time said accountants will save the world and he and he and i had a chance to and it's been quoted many times i'm sure many of you have heard that before and i had the chance to ask him what he meant by that and he brought it back to accountability and transparency and i think those are two really critical pieces and our, our members i hope accountants will be bold and provide leadership in ensuring that there's accountability and transparency as we drive forward on purpose all right call to action I've also heard of accountants referred to as uh, accountant warriors, so that's maybe another kind of riff <laughs> off of that idea. Um, Upcar. Coral, my idea would really be two things. One is, first of all, we can't disconnect the finance world from our real world, which is people and planet where we live and who we connect with from a social standpoint. So we have to recognize that. But I do believe, and I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I didn't believe that impact investing along with a number of the other initiatives referred to by my colleagues can have a huge transformative impact in the preservation of our planet and the preservation of society to allow businesses 
to flourish in the longer term through creating greater social cohesion and a planet that we can all live on. Okay, impact investing um, and a, an accelerated move towards that and financing purpose-driven companies through that means. And then uh, Roger, how about you? Final piece of advice, take away. Yeah. Just, just like we have a responsibility in, in helping our planet survive the climate change, we have the same opportunity with, uh, with purpose in our investments and outcomes that are non-financial uh, with our investments. So ask your advisor, ask your pension plan at the corporate level, you know, think about these things. If you give money to a foundation, have, ask them if they're aligned in their, in their investments. All of that, we all have a say. All of those micro actions come out to big the results. All right, uh, Rahul. Um, one framework I would look at is to say that very successful companies of the past got really good at shareholder engagement. A successful company of the future will have mastered stakeholder engagement. Well, there we have it, folks, from the front lines of purpose with investors, accountants, and a representative of boards uh, really weighing in on their thoughts on what it would take to accelerate this narrative in Canada and beyond. Uh, you can tell by their excitement that this is happening already. This is not a fiction. This is not a made up world. And all we're doing here is looking at strategies to accelerate that. Um, and they've provided many ideas to inspire us uh, on our path. And we are now then with these ideas in hand going to go into a 30 minute breakout to discuss uh, what struck you and to identify a few concrete steps to advance purpose governance, purpose finance and purpose accounting in Canada and who might be involved. And if the tech could drop in the questions into the chat now, I would like everybody to take a moment to copy that chat because you're gonna need to copy and paste it into your breakout room to be able to follow uh, the questions. So please take a moment, all of you there to copy it and be prepared to paste it. Um, when you get into your breakout room, please turn on your camera and your microphone, which is at the top left of your screen. We have note takers who will be in most breakout rooms, but not all. And if you don't have a, one of these record trackers in your group, please type your ideas into the conversation chat. We really do need a record of your input because we wanna take that information after. We would like you to designate someone to copy and paste the chat into an email and send it to the Social Purpose Institute. And it will be this way we'll get your ideas to inform the Purpose Economy Roadmap. So please do um, take a copy of the questions. And again, ensure someone in your breakout room, uh, paste them in the conversation uh, box once you get there. And again, finally, thank you to our panelists for stepping up on this uh, conversation and helping shed light on the path ahead and the optimism that you bring to the quest. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.